What you just heard was a 911 call made by 13-year-old Megan Zanella. Watching in horror, Megan witnessed her mother being stabbed 178 times by her 18-year-old foster sister, Sabrina Zunick. By the time emergency services arrived at the family home in Willoughby Hills, Ohio, it was already too late. Lisa was pronounced dead at the scene, and all fingers were firmly pointed at Sabrina. But was she the only person responsible for the murder? Welcome back to Crime A to Z, where we detail cases and criminals from their very beginning until well after other reporting ends. Today we'll be exploring the tragedy that can unfold when bad circumstances are paired with evil intentions. Sabrina Zunick had a rough start in life. Struggling with drug and alcohol addiction, Sabrina's parents, Susan Edwards and Mark Zunick, spent most of their adult life in trouble with the law, typically caught between a revolving door of prison and probation. Ten years before Sabrina was born, her mother, Susan, spent six months in Marysville prison after being convicted of grand theft. And her father, who suffered from paranoid schizophrenia, was known to police for supplying drugs to teenagers on the streets of Cleveland. By the time Sabrina was born on October 27, 1994, the unmarried couple had a string of charges and were crippled with addiction. By February 1996, Mark had been arrested once again, this time for domestic violence against Susan. Mark's mother advised him to visit a doctor about his mental condition, but he refused and continued on a downward spiral until Sabrina was placed in the care of her grandmother. By the age of four, Sabrina was diagnosed with ADHD and struggled to connect with children her age. As a teenager, she attended Wycliffe High School in Cleveland where she was regularly disciplined for behavioral problems. At school, Sabrina continued to struggle to connect with her peers and many times she was removed from public areas after getting into aggressive fights with classmates. Eventually, at age 14, Sabrina was surrendered to the care system and sent to a group home, run by Children's Services on the outskirts of Painesville. Sabrina would spend the next several years in state care and different group homes. As Sabrina struggled through her teen years she was eventually diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder, bipolar, anxiety and depression. In July 2011, things finally began to look hopeful for 16-year-old Sabrina. She was placed with Kevin and Lisa Nofel, a couple living with their two daughters, Megan, from Lisa's first marriage, and their younger daughter Haley. By all accounts, Sabrina was looking forward to having a fresh start. Lisa believed she was well-equipped to help Sabrina as she moved into her late teens. Lisa's husband, Kevin, was a truck driver who worked long hours to support his family. Sabrina quickly settled into the couple's Willoughby Hills home. Their one-acre three-bedroom home housed a sizable playhouse, swings, a trampoline and a slide in their front yard. Sabrina would spend hours outside with her new sisters playing together. Five months after Sabrina was placed with the Nofuls, she was getting good grades in school for the first time in her life. But back at home, cracks began to show. Sabrina grew increasingly more jealous of Megan and Haley, believing that her foster parents preferred the two girls over her. Sabrina took her anger out on Lisa and the pair would fight regularly. With tensions high, Sabrina grew close to Kevin, who would return from long trips away in his truck and do his best to calm the situation. 
Kevin would take Sabrina out alone to both appease his wife and to help Sabrina settle into family life. The couple reminded themselves about the horrific upbringing Sabrina had had and took steps to try to make her feel more included. But that was where the issues really began. As Sabrina and Kevin grew closer, family and friends would notice strange behavior between the two of them. They were overly friendly and instead of acting like a father and daughter, they would make uncomfortable sexual jokes in front of others. And by the spring of 2012, Kevin and 17-year-old Sabrina were having a full-blown affair. He was sleeping with her, inside of their shared home, as well as away from it. And he'd pay her for photos of herself for him to look at, while he was away for work. The pair snuck around together without Lisa's knowledge, laughing at her for being so trusting and believing that Kevin really was just helping Sabrina. Over the course of that summer, Lisa and Kevin began fighting often, and the subject of divorce was mentioned. Kevin, not wanting to lose Sabrina, even spoke with a social worker about the possibility of keeping his foster child in his care should they split up. Kevin would get up early to drop Sabrina off at Willoughby South High School and pull over during the ride to have relations with her. By all accounts, Sabrina was thriving at her new school. She was always on time, never failed a class, and had begun speaking with her teachers about the possibility of attending a school for cosmetology once she graduated. But behind closed doors, a plot was being hatched. Kevin had spent months grooming Sabrina, telling her that he would divorce Lisa and the pair could live freely as a couple and raise his daughter Haley together. Sabrina was excited that her life seemed to be falling into place. But there was a catch. One autumn day, on the way to school, instead of pulling over to connect with his foster daughter, Kevin pulled the car to the side of the road and began sobbing. He told Sabrina how he was on the verge of suicide and recounted a fight he'd gotten into with Lisa the previous evening. Kevin told Sabrina that his wife was worth more to him dead than alive and that there was an $800,000 life insurance policy on Lisa. Kevin painted a picture of a perfect family life once his wife was out of the way, and he began manipulating Sabrina into doing his dirty work. With Sabrina on board, Kevin taught her how to stage a scene that would look like a burglary. He showed her techniques on how to stab and murder his wife, and he reassured her that if she was caught, she would only serve two to five years because of her age and background. He promised her that afterward they buy a house, and Sabrina could be a mother figure to Haley. Around this time Sabrina began making inquiries into hiring a hitman to do the job for her. She asked a friend, Autumn Pavlik, if she could help her find someone to do the job. Autumn backed away completely, telling Sabrina this was not the road she wanted to go down. But Sabrina was determined to proceed with the plan and the fantasy life Kevin had constructed in her mind. Eventually Autumn moved away, but the conversations of hitmen and murder would eventually resurface. By October 27, Sabrina turned 18. Legally she should have left the foster care system and Kevin behind. Instead, she petitioned the court to be allowed to stay with Lisa and Kevin, citing the need to finish high school. Her request was accepted and just three weeks later, on November 16, the devastating screams of Megan Zanella rang out to a dispatcher on 911. 911, what is your emergency? Don't, don't, don't. You gotta kill my mom! Please! What is going on? Hello? Everyone with a knife! I can't breathe here! Okay, this is your sister? Yeah, and she's doing my mom with a knife, but you please tell me. She's doing what to your mom with a knife? You need to take a deep breath for me so I can understand you. No, I did! You need to let my mom do the dog, please! What? <laughs> Thirteen-year-old Megan had been jarred awake by Lisa's screams. Running into her mother's room she found Sabrina, wearing a ski mask, and stabbing her mother over, and over, and over again. While on the phone with the police, Megan pleaded with Sabrina to stop, 
to no avail. When dispatch arrived, an officer found Sabrina holding a 15-inch knife with a 9-inch blade that had bent out of shape. The youngest daughter, Haley, had been hiding in the master bedroom closet, and the older daughter, Megan, was unconsolable after having watched her mother's murder play out in front of her. A later coroner report found that Lisa had been stabbed 178 times with wounds to her torso, neck, and head. The defensive wounds were found to be complex, as if Sabrina had twisted the knife inside her. Kevin Nofel conveniently was driving in Michigan when his wife was killed. When he came home and was told the news, his reaction seemed a bit off to the police. Instead of showing any sign of grief, he seemed more curious than anything. Sabrina Zunik was taken to the hospital for treatment of the wounds to her hands she had sustained during the attack. Ten hours later, she was taken to the police station for questioning. What, uh, what do you recall? From yesterday? Mm-hmm. Can I get down with my homework? I don't know. And that's it. Mm-hmm. So what was that? And we're at home? Mm-hmm. Following the plan Kevin had cleverly laid out, Sabrina begins to feign memory loss, telling officers that she can't remember the events of the night before. Would anything unusual happen? I don't know. Trying to get Sabrina to crack, detectives try a new line of questioning to try to get an emotional reaction out of Sabrina. Hey, how do you get along with Kevin? Kevin and me are cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's more the one that helps me out. Mm -hmm. Because this has Megan to deal with. And so we made agreements a long time ago that if I need anything, that I go to Kevin. As they hoped, Sabrina begins to open up about Kevin and how he's the one she approaches when she needs something. How about well, with Lisa? How do you feel with her? Me and Lisa have never been the best. She never seemed to like me and she's been wanting me out of the house. Detectives find the line of questioning they hope will tap into Sabrina and Lisa's relationship. They hoped that going into it from this angle might force Sabrina to reveal her motives behind the sudden attack. What's your thoughts on how Lisa is not alive now? What? Well, I see you had a knife. You stabbed Lisa. I did. Mr. And, and, and Megan called the police. It can't be true. Great, it is. I'm sorry. This is really dead. To me, I'm Sorry. I don't believe that nobody else is hurt. Nobody else is hurt. Thank goodness. Police watch carefully as Sabrina reacts to the news. With Sabrina still feigning memory loss and appearing distressed when told about the murder she committed, the police end the interview there and decide to go and search the Nofel family home. After the initial questioning was finished, Sabrina was remanded at Lake County Jail. The very next day, just one day after his wife was killed, police were surprised to learn that Kevin visited the jail, demanding to see Sabrina. Kevin was turned away, but friends and family continued to note that his behavior was not that of a typical grieving husband. Over the next couple of months, police continued to build a case against Sabrina. In the back of their minds though, they knew it was something more than an enraged teen springing an attack on an unsuspecting foster mother. Attempts were made by police to question Kevin under the guise of speaking about Lisa's work. Kevin, do you know anything that was happening at the house the night before you left for work that night? Well, was, was, hang on a second. We just talked about talking about his wife's work. What's going on at the house the night before is not his wife's work. Okay. Where does your wife work at? Cuyahoga County Children's Family Services. What does she do there? She was a social worker for the um, Children's Section Center. Were you and uh, Lisa in the process of going through a divorce? Okay, now we're getting outside the uh, scope. 
Police noted how he would not look at them, looked down, and appeared to be nervous when questions were asked about the night of the attack. And with Sabrina's silence, they couldn't build a case. Over the following months after his wife's murder, Kevin was able to cash in on her life insurance policy. He remodeled his home, took flying lessons, installed a swimming pool, purchased expensive cars, and even bought a $225,000 home in Florida. Instead of acting like the grieving husband, Kevin was making the most of the money, comfortable with the fact the 18-year-old he'd groomed to do his dirty work was taking the fall for him. But his world would come crashing down in May 2013 when Sabrina Zunik entered into proffer negotiations with detectives. The first step towards a plea agreement, a proffer would allow Sabrina to be completely honest about her part in the murder without it being used against her in court. And it would also allow for her to divulge to police anyone else who was involved in the crime. What we believe from conversations is that what led up to this homicide, to this murder, is that there was another party involved in planning that. Yes. This is Kevin Knafel, my foster father. With the agreement in place, Sabrina divulged to police that it was Kevin who conspired with her to murder Lisa Nofel. It was Kevin's idea, and it was talked about after we were having sexual relations, and him and Lisa were having problems in marriage. He wanted to get a divorce, but Haley, which is a three-year-old daughter of his and her, was in the picture, and he wanted full custody she would get custody or it would be shared and he didn't want that happening so the alternative was for this to happen for the first time she outlined to police the motives for the attack she described for detectives how kevin had groomed her into believing this was the only way they could be together when was it after you started to live there on a daily basis that your relationship with kevin changed when did the sexual nature start to change um it all started not with sex, but with massages because he was a truck driver and his legs would cramp, so it was in her thigh. Then it progressively got into sex. Does he ever tell you, hey, you can't tell anybody about this? All the time. Did he say what would happen if you told Then you'd be taken out of my care and I could lose my foster parent license. What did you say in response to that? I would never do that. Tell on him. Sabrina had been convinced that murder was the only way. She told detectives that for the first time in her life she was happy in a home and didn't want anything to take her away from Kevin and the security he provided. So, when Kevin came to Sabrina with a plan to murder, how could she, still a child, turn him down? Sabrina told detectives about how Kevin said Lisa was worth more to him dead than alive and how after he convinced her to proceed with the murder, Kevin purchased two life insurance policies for Lisa, totaling over $750,000. With Sabrina's confession, police began building a case against Kevin. In the weeks after Sabrina spoke to detectives, they began reaching out to anyone who might be able to back up her version of events. Sabrina's old friend, Autumn Pavlik, who Sabrina had once asked for help in hiring a hitman, was approached. Autumn had moved away from the area shortly before Lisa was killed, but always remembered the chilling conversations with Sabrina in the weeks leading up to her death. Officers visited Autumn in California and asked her if she would call Kevin and leave him a message that she needed to speak to him about something important. According to both Sabrina and Autumn, Kevin knew about the hitman's request and detectives were hoping hearing Autumn's voice again might cause him to panic. It worked. Kevin called Autumn, unaware that the phone call was being recorded by police. On the call, Autumn tells Kevin that she's worried about being dragged into the case if someone ever found out about the hitman conversation. Kevin reassured Autumn that there was nothing she could be dragged into. Kevin didn't divulge much information on the call, so the police switched gears. By early July, Autumn was back in Ohio visiting family, so police asked her to go to Kevin's home, wearing a wire. 
Autumn went inside and stayed there for 43 minutes telling Kevin how worried she was about being arrested for the hitman conversation. Again, Kevin refused to admit to his part, telling Autumn that Sabrina said a lot of damn things. With Autumn's help being a dead end, police looked into Kevin and Sabrina's phone records, desperate to find something that would corroborate Sabrina's confession. It was here that they struck gold. Detectives found that between November 1st and November 16th, Kevin and Sabrina had exchanged over almost 1,500 text messages. A whopping 78 of those messages were made in the very short and critical five to six hour time frame before Lisa's murder. While the details of those text messages was not divulged to the public, their case finally began to unfold. On August 9, 2013, Kevin Nofel was arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit aggravated murder, complicity to aggravated murder, and six counts of sexual battery. Though it was obvious who committed the murder, the police wanted to make sure Kevin did not get away with the planning and coercion he placed on Sabrina in the lead-up to his wife's death. Kevin Nofel's trial began in May 2014. Sabrina's confession was the driving force behind all the testimony heard during the trial. After proceedings were over, the jury took just over nine and a half hours to come back with a verdict. Guilty of six counts of sexual battery. Guilty of three counts of complicity to commit aggravated murder and guilty of two counts of conspiracy to commit aggravated murder. Kevin was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Sabrina was tried after Kevin in August 2014 and pleaded guilty to one count of murder. Sabrina Zunig admitted stabbing the Willoughby Hills foster mother to death. And Are you knowingly, freely, and voluntarily pleading guilty to one count of aggravated murder? Yes, Your Honor. Did you purposely cause the death of Lisa Canapo? Yes, Your Honor. And did you use prior calculation and design and planning in order to commit that murder? Yes, Your Honor. Sabrina was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 30 years. During the sentencing she read out the following statement. I want to say how sorry I am for all those I hurt. Lisa did not deserve what happened to her. I ask forgiveness be given to me not for my benefit but for those who need the healing process to begin. I can't explain how much remorse I have and how much sadness I deal with. After the sentencing, her defense attorney spoke out, saying that Kevin hijacked her future since Sabrina will be 47 years old by the time she is likely to be released in 2042. As of the time this video is being produced in 2022, Sabrina is 27 years old and is currently incarcerated at the Dayton Correctional Institution in Ohio. The facility, which opened in 1987 holds up to 857 inmates. Through re-entry programs, this facility focuses a high priority on preparing offenders for release. Inmates are given the skills they need for job interviews, resume writing, and reintegrating back into society through re-entry programs. Academic programs offer inmates classes and testing for the GED while also teaching adult basic education. An adoption program at the Dayton Correctional Institution enables prisoners to interact with abandoned dogs to train and get them ready for adoption. The inmate learns a new skill that they can utilize for work once they are released from prison through vocational training in plumbing, landscaping, animal training, tailoring, food production, and HVAC. Kevin Nofel, now 52, is serving his sentence at the Lake Erie Correctional Institution, where he was admitted in 2014. The facility is a privately owned prison for minimum and medium security inmates that opened in 2000 and had just over 1,700 inmates as of 2015. Since then, Kevin has made multiple failed attempts to appeal his sentence. And, compared to Sabrina, conditions at the for-profit prison at Lake Erie aren't as comfortable. 
The prison has been at the forefront of damning reports suggesting that staff are not adequately trained and inmates are kept in unsafe, unhygienic living conditions where inmates have previously died following drug overdoses. Lake Erie prisoners are required to participate in work assignments, education programs, and unit programs. So, for Kevin, the day-to-day -day misery in the Lake Erie Correctional Institution won't end for at least another 22 years. Thank you so much for watching, we hope this video did justice to Lisa Nofel. Many people express mixed emotions about Sabrina Zunik. She was clearly the killer, but analysts close to the case claimed that Kevin knew Sabrina's distinct vulnerabilities of having never had a stable home life or experiencing love, and he played off of those needs to get the outcome he wanted. If so, does that absolve her of the blame? And, if not Sabrina would he have coerced someone else into killing Lisa? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. And if you want to see more videos like this one, please be sure to hit like, and definitely hit subscribe so you never miss a single video.